fix. Happening now, Tropical Storm Elsa making landfall in Cuba at this hour. A critical interaction point that'll dictate future impacts here in the United States, especially here in the state of Florida. A live update plus a meteorologist Q&A starts now here on Tracking the Tropics. Hey there, folks. JB Buno here with you live on Tracking the Tropics from your hurricane headquarters. Great to have KXA and Chief Meteorologist David Yeomans joining us from Texas. Everybody you might remember David's work in Hurricane Laura last year. Great to have him back on the program. We're minutes away from taking your questions here in a live meteorologist Q&A coming up here on Track in the Tropics. You can use hashtag HeyDavid, hashtag HeyJB, or hashtag HeyIan4, meteorologist Ian Oliver standing by with this latest update here on Tropical Storm Elsa. We have a landfall imminent here, Ian. Thanks, JB. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, of course, we've been tracking Elsa throughout the holiday weekend. If you've been with us on tracking the tropics, really the reasoning behind the forecasts hasn't changed much at all. Everything going to plan so far. We did, though, just get some new information from the National Hurricane Center with the 2 o'clock update. And yes, we've got Elsa making landfall as a tropical storm on the south coast of Cuba. For reference, this is about 85 miles off to the southeast of Havana. Another change that we saw in the 2 o'clock advisory, it's slightly weaker. And again, that was forecast as the storm continues to interact with land and some higher terrain in Cuba, further weakening expected as this center of circulation moves on shore and spends a good amount of time on land over the next several hours, eventually re-emerging into the southeastern Gulf of Mexico and the Florida Strait. So this is the 2 o'clock advisory from the National Hurricane Center. This is not a new forecast track because this was an intermediate advisory, but this came out at 11 a.m. What we saw here with the forecast path slightly nudged back to the west. Again, we've got the Tampa Bay area on the east side of that cone of uncertainty. Need to be careful with this. You know, we always talk about focusing on the cone, but even areas outside of the cone, we are expecting this to be a lopsided system as it approaches us. Southwesterly wind shear pushing most of the impactful weather to the east side of this circulation, which is essentially where we're at in west central Florida. But the trends over the last couple of days have been gradually shifting back to the west. So we'll have to watch that closely as we move on through the rest of this Monday. From there, it eventually accelerates up the east coast and toward the Canadian Maritimes as we head into the weekend. But there's a closer look at the track close to us here in west central Florida. The path at this point, the most likely path, would take it towards either the northern part of the nature coast or even up into Florida's Big Bend. And that's what we've seen with these forecast models. The spaghetti plot showing that shift just a little bit back to our west. A path, once again, that's reminiscent of what we saw end of the season last year. Over the weekend, we've been talking a lot about Tropical Storm Ada and some of the coastal impacts with that. David, I'm sure you've been watching this over the last couple of days, some of those subtle shifts back to the west. We're going to have to watch that closely as we head on through the rest of the day today, and especially once the system emerges off of uh, Cuba. No doubt, Ian. Uh, thanks for having me on today, and great analysis there of the track and I'm sure you guys are all bracing for your potential impacts there in Florida and especially in Tampa Bay. Uh, you know, according to our friend Philip Klotzbach at Colorado State, this is the first July storm to make landfall in Cuba since 2005. Typically, the June and July storms, as you know, they're closer into the coast, closer into the Gulf, even heading toward Texas or Louisiana, like we saw so many of last year. Um, what happens as it's over Cuba over the next six hours or, or whatnot uh, is really going to be crucial, as you mentioned. You know, it is a mountainous island. First of all, land obviously disrupts a developing tropical storm to start with, but Cuba as a nation has 6,000 foot mountains in it. Now those are to the east of where this storm is, but it looks like it's tracking over 1,000 foot, 1,500 foot mountains. So in addition to losing its heat source and its uh, fuel, the warm ocean water, it's also really getting disrupted. Um, you mentioned that the storm is lopsided. We've already got westerly wind shear blowing most of the thunderstorms and winds uh, to the east side of the center. And this storm has kind of been lopsided for its uh, its entirety. You know, when it was moving 30 miles per hour uh, in the Windward Islands, it had vertical alignment issues because it was just getting sheared apart moving so fast. Now it's, you know, still kind of unable to stack the lower level vortex with the mid-level center. Uh, and now it's going to have a really hard time over the mountains. So as you mentioned, we are not expecting a hurricane as it looks right now. It's not all about warm water as it comes back over the Gulf. It's really also about wind shear. And that could be a, a, a big factor, maybe a saving grace for some folks in Florida this time around.
totally agree. Well-formed tropical systems can have trouble passing over land masses in higher terrain. Elsa is not a well-formed system. This has been a, a storm over the last couple days in the Caribbean that has tried repeatedly to develop a vertically stacked structure, but because of that wind shear, it stayed tilted. It's never been able to completely develop that. And with that, Thankfully, over the last couple days, we, we didn't see uh, much of that intensification. Wanted to show you where the tropical storm alerts are at right now. We've got tropical storm warnings in effect, essentially for the entire coastline of Tampa Bay, down into southwest Florida, and all the way up to the Suwannee River. We've also got storm surge watches in effect, and this will be a concern. We know that, regardless of what this looks like when it emerges off of Cuba, even a lower end tropical system can create some big problems for coastal areas. We're going to talk much more closely about impacts here across the Tampa Bay area, but I think like Ada, this will be a storm that's remembered kind of in two different ways, depending on where you live. If you live in a coastal spot, a flood prone area, or if you live in an inland area, you'll likely remember this in, in two separate ways. Impacts really going to be confined to coastal areas with this outside of the possibility for some stronger thunderstorms and isolated tornadoes across inland spots. So you see that path is off to our west, but the rainfall accumulation forecast showing heavy rain a possibility across the Tampa Bay area, two to four inches with localized amounts up to around six inches. You know we've gotten soaked over the last several days, early part of July, and then especially that latter part of the month of June. So we'll be watching for flooding concerns, certainly. This is a storm surge potential, and you see that blue shading here across much of our area, indicating the potential for about one to as much as three feet of worst case storm surge or water rise with this system up towards the Citrus County and up into Levy County into the Nature Coast. It's where we could see slightly higher tallies than that. So this is the coastal impacts that we're expecting here across the Tampa Bay area. We're mostly talking about I-75 and back toward the coast. Rain tallies four to as much as six inches possible. Wind gusts, 40 to 60 miles per hour. And these strong rain bands that'll likely contain the highest wind gusts. There's a lot of spin in the atmosphere with those. So isolated tornadoes, always a concern. And that's a concern we'll be tracking for you very closely on Max Defender 8 as we head into the second half of the day tomorrow, the afternoon and the evening. Looks like the evening locally is likely when we'll see the worst of it. Also, that sea level rise, two to four feet possible at high tide. We'll watch that high tide cycle that occurs after midnight tomorrow night. That would be about 3 a.m. Wednesday morning, the high tide at St. Pete Pier. We'll have those high tide times for you, but that'll be the cycle after midnight tomorrow night that we're most concerned about as far as any potential surge with this system. And then for inland spots, that's where we are expecting to see more just some strong thunderstorms. Rainfall tallies a little bit less, two to four inches. Wind gusts about 20 to 40 miles per hour, maybe slightly higher than that in some of the rain bands that drift through our inland spots. And of course, that threat for an isolated tornado with a lot of shear in the atmosphere. Flooding possible. Trees could come down just because the Ground is so saturated after all the rain we've had lately. Over a foot of rain in June when we were coming out of a mild drought, and then we've seen several inches of rainfall already here in July. This is Max Defender Radar, S-Ban Radar here across Tampa Bay. A very powerful radar that will allow us to see some of the heavier rain bands that approach the area. We are expecting the possibility for some spotty, heavy downpours as we move through this afternoon and evening with some tropical moisture above us. And that is, of course, before we start feeling the impacts from ELSA tomorrow. So it's going to be a busy stretch here across the Tampa Bay area. Infrared satellite, again, not showing the healthiest tropical system. What we're hoping for, which is still a possibility, is big disruption of this storm as it moves across Cuba and then no strengthening in the eastern Gulf of Mexico, perhaps a track farther off to the west that would limit some of those impacts to us here locally, but we need to prepare for tropical storm conditions with the tropical storm warning now in effect for coastal areas in Tampa Bay. JB, David, this is going to be a storm that even if not powerful, not a higher end tropical storm, still could have some big impacts. Yeah, I want to pass along here to you folks that our thoughts and prayers, our whole track in the tropics team, thoughts and prayers. We're thinking about the folks in Cuba because this is a, uh, a time, an hour now where, again, if you're just following or just tuning in here, we have the breaking news that 
uh, that we have a Cuba landfall here that's pretty much imminent. It's happening now, according to the National Hurricane Center. Great to have KXAN Chief Meteorologist David Yeomans there with you, everybody on the right side of your screen. You see the bottom of your screen as well. We want you to ask questions here in the Facebook Live comment section, a chance for you to ask questions to one of our meteorologists on stream here today, David and Ian Oliver. And if you've never been with us here before in Tracking the Tropics, it's as simple as using one of those hashtags in the Facebook Live comment section. Hashtag Hey David, hashtag Hey Ian, or hashtag Hey JB. And we'll get to this first question here for David Yeomans from Sarah. Does more time in the warm waters mean better chance of intensification before landfall? And Sarah's question here, David, very focused on what happens north of Cuba when we have Elsa in the Gulf of Mexico. Absolutely. Hey, Sarah, thanks so much for watching Tracking the Tropics today. And yes, the warm waters are the life source, the fuel for a developing tropical storm or hurricane. So once it, you know, a storm moves over land, obviously there's no more warm water under it. That's why these things die out so quickly when they're over land. When it moves over an island nation like Cuba, it weakens quickly and then it's back over the water so it can get its act together again. The water in the Gulf of Mexico is actually, it's warm enough to support a storm and to support, support strengthening. But in some areas of the Northeastern Gulf, it's actually a little bit cooler than normal. So we're not seeing, you know, the kind of rocket fuel, very warm waters that we can see, uh, especially later in the summer, that could be a saving grace and limit some intensification. As I mentioned, though, it's not all about the warm water. I think warm water is the most uh, publicized thing that can strengthen a tropical system. It's also about mid-level humidity in the storm-centered environment. It's also about wind shear, which is wind direction and speed at different levels of the environment. And because of this trough, this, this separate low pressure that we have over the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, it's getting these westerly winds in the upper levels of the storm. And that's kind of blowing everything off to the side. So that's why when you look at the satellite that Ian and JB were showing us, it's not a centered storm around that little icon with all the thunderstorms right around it beautifully. Look at that right there. All of the thunderstorms, those big oranges and reds, they're on the east side. And that's because this thing is getting west winds in the mid levels of the atmosphere that's kind of trying to rip it apart. So the short answer to your question after I've already answered the long one uh, is yes, warm water will help this thing get its act together, but it's not gonna be able to rapidly intensify into a major hurricane uh, because of that wind shear. See a lot of great questions coming in. We got Ian Oliver sitting back down with us here, everybody in your hurricane headquarters. A lot of great questions to get to here on Track in the Tropics. Use the hashtag, ask a question, and we can do, hey, maybe a two for one here with this one. Uh, Carrie asking, hashtag KJB, is there any chance it will go more west? And then following up that comment here as well. Thank you, Carrie, for watching here on Track in the Tropics. Sonia asking your hashtag, hey, David, I'm in Panama City. Are we going to be affected? We waited on this vacation for a year, and it's rained the first three days constantly. So we've got some viewers tuning in from the uh, Florida panhandle, Ian and David. Yeah, Ian, you want to take the first it, one? It is. It's a tough time of the year. Uh, I'm sure, you know, if folks arriving in the Tampa Bay area for the first part of the holiday weekend. Didn't, didn't love what they saw with what we had throughout the day on Saturday. Rounds of heavy rainfall. So yes, it is tough even in the absence of tropical systems. I do think the trends farther off to the west will like could, could persist. I think that's becoming the most likely scenario with likely a middle of the road tropical storm passing off to our west. You remember over the weekend that center of the cone, which we don't like to look at, we like to look at the entire cone. That was more situated directly over us here in Tampa. Now it's shifted a little bit farther off to the west. That has been the trends. Some of the higher resolution forecast models, the hurricane models, actually keep about a middle of the road tropical system staying off to our west. Lopsided storm. So you're, if you're asking about Panama City, even though we're going to have a system that at this point, the most likely landfall location would be somewhere northern part of the nature coast or even up into the Big Bend. It's a lopsided system with all the impactful weather on the east side of it. So you would still be west of it at that point. Be on the lookout for some, some dangerous rip current risk, likely some higher waves. Uh, you definitely want to be mindful of that, especially if it's a vacation and you're going to be having fun of the beach. But yeah, the direct impacts are staying farther off to the east. But we're going to have to watch that closely. Tropical storm force winds, the last advisory it was 70 miles per hour. Let me double check that in this, uh, oh, excuse me, 70 miles. There it is in, the, in this latest update. It's still just 70 miles outward from that center of circulation. So this is not a broad storm at all. It's not a well-formed storm. So we're going to have to watch the exact track of the system closely for us here in Tampa Bay. Maybe we can keep the center 
about 70 miles ish offshore and that would limit JB some of our impacts locally. Conversely, that center can come a bit closer just off our shore to the to the west is kind of the worst solution for us, even if it's just the middle of the road tropical storm. That's right. And to address the Panama City viewer question, I mean, like Ian's saying, the worst of this storm is on the east side of the center and it's going to stay that way since the westerly wind shear is going to continue. So that means I, I actually have a coworker uh, between Destin and Panama City right now as well. They're getting nonstop rain. That, that looks to me like it's more from that low pressure system over the central Gulf that's just pumping in moisture there, not even from Elsa at this point. But if we do get Elsa moving east of Panama City, which is quite confident at this point, that would put it on the drier west side. That could even mean some offshore winds. Maybe, Ian, I don't know if I'm crazy, but the weather could improve <laughs> in those areas yeah. when Elsa passes by. Yeah, anytime you can get a north wind in the so you know, in Austin, anytime you can get a north wind in the summer by any means, it's uh, it's appreciated. <laughs> Uh, let's get to this now, next. Ian, I actually had a quick question for you, if I could. Um, Tampa Bay, I mean, you have a lot of local expertise on storm surge and, and the, the shore structure and whatnot. It seems to me if we get a storm like this, you know, 50, 60 mile per hour tropical storm moving just offshore, you guys would probably start with an offshore wind, mm -hmm. right, before the storm passed by. And then you'd end up with an onshore wind after the storm comes to its closest point. So is it possible that some folks on the uh, the Tampa coast and in St. Petersburg area, is it possible that you guys could see actually a, a negative storm surge at first or sort of a withdrawal of the Gulf at first and then after the storm passes, a bit more of that surge coming in? Yeah, I don't know if you saw that video from Irma, which which you know, went, went- I remember, yeah. That was wild. It, it felt apocalyptic when the water essentially left the bay. The bay is very shallow. I believe the average depth is between eight and 12 feet. The issue is if you look, I'm trying to get this graphic pulled up so we can look at it a little bit more visually. We do have a component, even with an offshore wind in the bay that pushes water into, into Pinellas County, which can create issues. There are, on the eastern side of that peninsula, which is Pinellas County, you have a lot of low-lying flood-prone areas. So you can push a little water in the bay, which there isn't you know, that much in the grand scheme of things as you compare it to a giant body of water like the Gulf of Mexico, we can get some water pushed into the uh, west side of the bay into Pinellas County, which can lead to some water rise locally there. But what we'll really be watching for, which I believe if I can put this into motion, we have the wind barbs on this. So there's the circulation. We've got a timestamp for you. That's five o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And that's exactly what you're talking about, David. First, we've got this onshore or excuse me, offshore wind that's blowing right. out of the east. But then as that center starts moving a little bit more off to the north from there, this is just after midnight tomorrow night, which is the high tide mm. cycle that we're worried about closer to 3 a.m. This is the point where we're starting to push water, water into the bay shallow situation we've got a shallow shelf just offshore here that's the time period where we would be most concerned so first like your point initially we will see very little concerns outside of areas that face off uh, to the east in pinellas county likely once we head towards uh, midnight and beyond the wind shifts onshore that's where we could run into trouble good news is this storm system's always been moving fairly quickly it's really one high tide cycle that we're concerned about Next one, the system's well off to our north, and those concerns start to dial back really quickly. Uh, got a lot of questions coming in. As a reminder here, folks, got a lot of questions coming in from Fox 46 Char uh, Charlotte's Facebook page. Uh, use the hashtags. We can get to your questions here, but we can only feature comments with those hashtags as a way, again, so that if you want to converse back and forth with your fellow commenters and not be featured here on Track in the Tropics, you can do so. But if you want your question and your name featured here on screen, you have to use one of the three hashtags, hashtag hey David, hashtag hey Ian, or hashtag hey JB. Uh, let's get to this one from Jessica Cheney, hashtag hey David, how bad do you think this will impact Charleston? Joining us here from WCBD's Facebook page in South Carolina. Thanks for joining us, Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And this is, uh, if we could pull up that track there, perfect shot. This, by that point, will have been over land for some time. So this obviously won't be a big hurricane coming off of the Atlantic into the South Carolina coast or into the Charleston area. Uh, this would be a weaker system. Now, we'll still get 35, 45 mile per hour gusts. Um, we'll still get lots of rainfall and the potential of some minor flooding impacts from that. Um, and remember, you know, we talk about 35, 45 mile per hour winds as nothing because sometimes we see 100 mile per hour winds on these maps. But I'll remind you that you can't stand up in anything more than 65 miles per hour. So a 45 mile per hour gust is still pretty significant and that can bring some small 
tree branches, uh, palm fronds down, depending on where you live. So those are the impacts that we expect in the Charleston area. Again, that map showing the possible passage over South Carolina early on Thursday morning. You guys might actually get a lot of the rain and uh, possible flooding impacts before the center arrives. So Wednesday night into very early Thursday, once the storm passes to your northeast, you'll be uh, kind of on the, the south side or southwest side, which would bring in a an onshore wind, which could kind of shut some of those impacts off for you. A great question here coming up for both David and Ian from Nicole Noel here. Hashtag hey Ian, I'm pretty sure Hurricane Michael took this similar path and Tampa was okay. Will this be similar to Michael? Michael was a whole different beast, a whole other. These two are not in the same realm. Michael being a, a well-formed major hurricane. This, that's what we've drawn more of the comparisons to Ada. One, because its path is similar and structure is a little bit similar. I'm trying to think of the other one. It might have been Cristobal that actually produced tornadoes here. It was another messy, lopsided system. That's what this is. This is not a well-formed, vertically stacked, classic hurricane signature that you would see. This is a sloppy, lopsided tropical storm, which can still cause significant issues just structurally and from an intensity standpoint. These are two very different systems. So even though the center of this could be passing well off to our west, the impacts are all confined to the east side of that center of circulation, which makes it uh, very difficult for us to dodge those. That's right. And counterintuitively, to piggyback off that, if you're several hundred miles away from a Category 5 hurricane, you can actually get sinking air on the outside of that storm, and it can be 100 degrees and sunny. Mm -hmm. If you're a couple hundred miles away from a weaker, sloppier storm like this, you can actually get rain and some gusty winds. So it's counterintuitive, but the weaker the storm, sometimes the broader the impacts can be, especially if you're going to be on the east side of this system as it comes into Florida. We got a lot of questions coming in from a lot of different towns across the southeast United States, especially, again, David Yeomans, Ian Oliver, J.B. Buno here with you live on Track in the Tropics. Uh, we're going to kind of bounce back and forth here as quickly as we can to get to as many of these questions as we can, bounce back and forth between Florida and between some of the other uh, states and regions in the impact zone, like this next one here from Christian Pope, WRIC's Facebook page in Richmond, Virginia. Hashtag, hey, David. What's the chance of Elsa hitting Farmville, Virginia? And I just did a quick check. Farmville being a little bit west of Richmond, kind of in that area between Richmond and Lynchburg. So here's the question from Chris, uh, Christian joining us here from Virginia, David. Great. Thanks for refreshing my, uh, my knowledge on small town Virginia. I'm not an expert on those. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, by the time it gets there again, it will have been over land for a day or two. Uh, this storm might be actually losing its tropical characteristics at that point. So not becoming, you know, a, a well-formed tropical storm as it has been at times, but instead just becoming, you know, more like a, a big mid-latitude cyclone, which you guys get in, in Virginia all the time, or think of it uh, as like a weak nor'easter to happen in the summertime instead of the winter. You guys will get some rain, you'll get some breezy winds, but we're not worried about any damage in that area as it looks right now. All right, next question coming in from Hayden uh, Heaney, hashtag Hey, Ian, are wind gusts over 70 to 75 miles per hour possible in the pockets of this storm? I'd say uh, very unlikely with this. We're, we're likely looking, again, middle-of-the-road tropical storm. The highlighted wind gust risk, mostly for coastal areas, is 40 to 60 miles per hour. The only exception to that would be in some of these potentially nastier rain bands that come through with storm. There's a lot of spin in the atmosphere with tropical systems. You could see a very isolated tornado risk. That's what we're going to be watching closely for any spin with max defender rate as we move on through the latter portion of the day tomorrow. It would have to be something like that to generate a wind gust up to that magnitude. That's a hurricane force wind. We're not forecasting that with this one. We got about another five or so minutes. So a last call for your questions here while we have two Phenomenal meteorologist here with us on Track in the Tropics. Chief Meteorologist David Yeomans joining us from KXAN, Austin, Texas. And Track in the Tropics Meteorologist Ian Oliver. You all know well, of course, here at WFLA in Tampa Bay. Let's get to this next one here for David from Angie Martinez. Hey, Fox 46 Charlotte's Facebook page uh, chiming in here. Hashtag, hey, David. I have plans to be in Be uh, Beaufort, uh, Beaufort, excuse me, South Carolina for Friday, and, uh, Friday through Sunday. Will the remains of Elsa be moved out uh, by then? Yeah, it looks like the weather should be improving there drastically by that point, by this coming weekend. Um, this is a, a fairly quick moving storm, as Ian was covering for us, and it, it really has been for most of its 
lifetime, even moving it up to 30 or 35 miles per hour at times in the Caribbean. Uh, here, you, here you see the storm path on Wednesday over uh, Georgia. Here it is on Thursday morning over South Carolina and then moving off the outer banks of North Carolina by later in the day Thursday. So behind these systems, you can actually get a drastic improvement in the weather uh, with the west wind coming off the land as opposed to an onshore wind coming from the ocean. So yeah, I think you guys have, have timed your trip well, at least in relation to this storm. I can't guarantee that you guys will be totally rain free um, from some other type of system moving through that will not be a tropical storm. All right, a, a question specifically here for the Tampa Bay area. We'll throw this one over Ian's way from Todd Green, hashtag AJB. How high of a possibility of the Howard Franklin Bridge closing on Tuesday and Wednesday due to storm surge and rain? Best modeling right now shows the worst of this likely coming through late evening tomorrow and then into the very early part of Wednesday. As far as flooding goes and water rise, it's going to be that fairly brief period overnight into the early part of Wednesday. That's where we're likely to see um, the highest water rise, two to four feet as far as the worst case scenario from the National Hurricane Center. There are some spots of the Howard Franklin Bridge where it kind of feels like you're driving on Tampa Bay before you get to the actual bridge on the east and west side in Pinellas and Hillsborough. I think it's pretty unlikely at this point, especially if this system stays a little bit weaker and stays farther off to the west. We can really lock that in once we see what it looks like on the opposite side of Cuba. So that's really going to be what determines it. Exactly how close to it to us does the storm come? What does it even look like at that point? Is it going to be a rough 12 hours as the system moves over the mountainous terrain in Cuba? We'll have those answers uh, certainly through the, the latter portion of the day today and early tomorrow once we see what it looks like after it comes off Cuba. Let's get to, Ian, maybe you can pull up the spaghetti models for me for this next question from Michelle here, uh, hashtag KJB. What model uh, is the purple line? And, you know, we, we talk all the time about the spaghetti models and what they represent, but uh, we have a very specific question here uh, from Michelle. So what are we looking at here in these latest spaghetti plots? You know, I don't have my legend with me. We're talking about this one here on the, the, the east side or here. I guess that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the one that would bring it right across Orlando or at least the, the center of the storm right across Orlando. That's an out, that, that is an outlier, and I would say that spaghetti plots are often very misunderstood. There are a lot of different models. Some are just based on climatology. Some don't even take into account essentially the actual reality of the storm. It's just, hey, it's, Je it's July the 5th. There's a storm here south of Cuba. This is where, from a climatological standpoint, this is where it would go. That's the forecast track. Some have clear biases, so I'm not sure exactly what one that is, but that's why it's spaghetti plots are used more for trends as opposed to taking any individual line as right. gospel. As like a, a consensus, yes. if you will. Uh, well, again, only a few more minutes here, everybody on Track in the Tropics. Throw this one David's way here next from... Uh, Marilyn here, uh, hashtag hey David, can you please give an update on Fort Myers, Florida? I have a daughter that lives there, worried mama here. Yeah, we got we to gotta calm mama's <laughs> nerves as far as Tropical Storm <laughs> Elsa, David. That, that could be my mom writing in. I've heard that line before. Uh, in Fort Myers, you know, and I'll defer to the experts with me here on the call on Florida, but uh, we'll likely get some some impacts on the east side of that storm. Absolutely. As it approaches over the next 24 and 36 hours, you'll get a lot of the thunderstorms. You'll get some of the breezy winds. But if this intensity forecast holds, which we really are quite confident that it won't surprise us and blow up when it gets back over the Gulf, uh, we're not worried about really anything life threatening in that area. As long as you stay smart, uh, make your daughter, you know, stays indoors during the storm and doesn't try to go out and surf during the storm. Uh, I'm really not worried about that area at all. What do you think, Ian? I totally agree. And you look at the pressure of this, 1,007 millibars, that, that's much higher than we would expect a tropical storm with max winds of 60 miles per hour. It, it's really a bizarre storm. The, the structure is bad. It has been bad. Now it's interacting with land. We have to see what kind of shape this is in. Best case scenario for us is it's in rough shape, emerging off the northwestern coast of Cuba. It enters... The warm sea surface temperatures, but again, not, you know, remarkably warm, as you were mentioning, David. And there's wind shear on it right away. And that's going to prevent additional restrengthening. It could be a, a low to middle of, the, middle of the road tropical storm that stays far enough west that it really reduces the impacts. And that's still a possibility at this point, but we just need to be prepared for the opposite of that, unfortunately, which would be a more well-formed tropical system that kind of puts the worst of its impacts directly above Florida's west coast. And that is why we have a tropical storm warnings up. 
and Mary right. Lee. And, and I do oh, think you're yep. right to highlight the, the, the tornado risk with this as well. That could be the worst thing that we see if we do get a few isolated tornadoes. Uh, that could end up causing the most damage that we see. Just really hard to tell, of course, where those might happen. Yeah, we did get a lot of questions uh, here about tor just tornadoes in general and whether or not spin-up tornadoes were possible here with this system. Uh, Marilyn Rosa here, hashtag AJB, hashtag AE, and we, we got a lot of questions here about Lakeland. Uh, an, an, actually, an overwhelming number of questions here in the Facebook Live comment section concerning Lakeland, Florida. Ian, what do we say about uh, Lakeland in particular? You know, it's funny, I was discussing uh, impacts earlier and I didn't use Lakeland as an example I used Auburndale but what I said was that people in Pinellas County versus people in Auburndale will probably remember this significantly differently as far as uh, how how much you see in terms of impacts it could be much ado about nothing if you live in coastal spots outside of that isolated tornado chance and that's what we really need to be mindful of we see so much energy, heat, humidity here in the atmosphere in the summertime. We get these strong thunderstorms that exist every afternoon in the absence of tropical systems. Then when you have a tropical system in the neighborhood, it introduces that spin into the atmosphere, which of course can help to create brief tornadoes across the area. We see that all the time, even with weak tropical systems. But as David mentioned, it's very difficult to pinpoint where exactly you might see one of those. So we'll be watching that in real time as we head on through tomorrow evening. These are your impacts across inland areas. Wind gusts 20 to 40 miles per hour. The storms on Saturday, we had gusts up to 50 miles per hour. Just for perspective, very heavy rainfall, likely two to four inches across a good portion of Polk County. It's the isolated tornado risk that we're going to have to watch closely as this passes on by. But for inland spots, I think that's really the extent of it with this one. And lastly here, Joy Starks, WJHL's Facebook page, hashtag Hey Dave. And what about Elsa? Well, I mean, we've been talking about Elsa for a lot of this episode. And when in Florian, Louisiana, and uh, without looking at a map, we can just talk about Louisiana, the state in general here, David, and talk about really... Uh, no impacts whatsoever, correct? No impacts from this thing. This is a, uh, even if this were a major hurricane, you guys are going to be way too far away from it for any impacts. And it's not a major hurricane. Also, as we've been discussing, the worst impacts are not on the west side toward Louisiana. They're on the east side of this storm. So Louisiana, you guys can breathe a sigh of relief. I know you need it after 2020. Uh, we're going to have to wait for the next storm to possibly threaten you guys. That's yeah. actually a great question to ask JB, who is an expert in all names of towns and parishes in Louisiana. Yeah, that's right. Everyone remembers <laughs> last year when we were trying to pronounce every little parish in Louisiana, and I had to read these yeah. comments from our Facebook Live viewers. And uh, when I tell you that I, I, I don't think I made the letter grade uh, on, <laughs> on pronouncing Flawless. those parishes. David, uh, next time that we have Louisiana... Uh, in the you know in our scope here in our periphery we're gonna bring you on and have you pronounce some of those parishes i'm sure you do it better than i <laughs> <laughs> everybody david yeomans kxan chief meteorologist david before we let you go what's just one thing that uh, about elsa that you're going to be watching here in the hours ahead um i'm going to be watching how it emerges into the gulf does it you know some models really rip this thing up over cuba and its passage there over the next six to eight hours is it even going to have its identity together enough to re-strengthen to 60, 65 mile per hour winds as it heads toward Florida, or will it remain a more ragged system? We're also going to be watching that wind shear uh, just blowing the worst impacts toward the east, which, as Ian and JB have mentioned, that could be bad news for Tampa because the center of this is going to go west of you. You guys are going to be on the east side of it. But even if you are in the bad news zone, so to speak, uh, this should not be a, a really memorable terribly destructive hurricane this will just be sort of a tropical storm so i know you guys in florida are used to getting these systems a couple times a year uh, this could be viewed as a good time to brush up on your preparedness plan uh, put that plan into action make smart decisions stay indoors as the storm blows through watch the latest on uh, on your local news with wfla uh, and then this could be kind of a good warm-up to anything else that may threaten you guys later in the hurricane season David Yeomans joining us, everybody, from KXAN in Austin, Texas. Give him a follow, and also check out, he's got some cool stuff on, on YouTube, that uh, that video for GQ talking about uh, uh, 
Severe weather in, uh, in movies was an was interesting watch, and uh, David uh, was able to talk to people or talk to GQ about that. It was a great piece there on, on social media. Folks, Thanks, speaking of JP. social media, um, we have uh, missed a lot of questions and comments, but we're back 5 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock Central here on Tracking the Tropics as we continue to tap into the expertise and experience of meteorologists across the southeastern United States. Uh, we're going to be joined actually by a meteorologist in the Northeast, I believe, for, uh, for our 5 o'clock update here on Tracking the Tropics. So that's our next update as we continue to monitor every movement every development with tropical storm elsa big thank you again to david and ian i'm jb we'll see you next time here on track in the tropics Thank you for watching Tracking the Tropics. 